Good morning. Welcome to Concordia College, the Offit School of Business, Lawrence's Center for Faith and Work. We are so glad that you're here, even though you might feel like you're sitting right under the thing, Majid. We'll be all right. Maybe we'll move back or something. Well, it's a good day to be in the room because it's snowing outside. Winter is finally here. I'm sure, you, yeah, I can see people warming their hands with the coffee. <laughs> so Lawrence's Center is committed to hosting and holding these kinds of conversations at the nexus of faith and work, values and ethics, because we want to prepare you and enhance your skill set at being able to speak truth to power and change your organizations and lead your organizations ethically. That's our goal. So I will invite, uh, it's a family affair today, so you'll, you'll notice that pretty quickly. Um, and I will invite the first family member of um, the first lady who will be speaking today, Jeff Pedersen, to please give the invocation. Well, good morning, everyone. Please join me in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, as Jesus described in his parable of the sower found in Matthew chapter 13, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he scattered the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and withered because they had no roots. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked the plants. Still other seeds fell on good soil, where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Lord God, I pray that we may be that good soil today, and may we take the seeds of today's presentation and grow them 100-fold in our lives, in our families, in our organizations, and in our world. We give thanks for today and for this time together, and we give thanks for the abundance in our lives. And Lord, we give you thanks for the food that we are about to eat, and for those who produced it, and those who prepared it, and for those who are going to serve us. Nourish us, dear Lord, body, mind, and spirit. In your holy name, amen. Well, good afternoon, President Kraft, colleagues, friends, family, and I look out and I see so many mentors. It's good to be here. It feels like homecoming to me. Concordia was such a wonderful place to raise our daughters. Dr. Ninjili, I want to thank you for the invitation to share my dissertation. Even after eight years of working on it and two years of writing, it is a topic that I am still passionate about, the intersection of faith and work. Well, we are approaching the season of Thanksgiving, so let's begin with a mindset of gratitude, which was a common theme among the Midwest leaders that I interviewed. One participant called gratitude a power tool in business. In addition to gratitude, participants also talked about the significance of spiritual mentors in their lives and the importance of being a mentor in the lives of others. Dr. Ernie Simmons, who I see, is among the spiritual mentors in my life. He said the following about spiritual mentoring in a 2002 Intersections article, and I quote, We are most affected in life by those persons who have embodied humanity and faith for us and opened up our own possibilities to do the same. Spirituality comes through embodiment. It is the encounter of individuals' lives 
as they are given to the needs of others, that spiritual mentoring occurs. I look around this room, and again, uh, my deep gratitude, I see so many spiritual mentors here. My interest in researching the connection between spirituality and leadership began two decades ago. It's been a long work in progress. It began when Jeff and I participated in a leadership pilgrimage which took us to the home of presentation foundress Nano Nagel in Cork, Ireland. This year happens to commemorate the 300th year since her birth. During this time, I was also fortunate to be working at Concordia. And through my participation in the Dovery Center for Faith and Learning, also included an academic year-long mentoring program. And another pilgrimage, a Lutheran heritage pilgrimage to Germany. And I see some of my fellow pilgrims in the room as well today. Both programs orchestrated by Dr. Simmons, the pilgrimage experience involved making the connection between our work and mission and the varied places that inspired organizational purpose and vision. Pilgrimage left me with a sense of giftedness, knowing that we draw from incredible resources of the past and that today we have the responsibility to advance the missions of the organi organizations we serve. These experiences piqued my interest in researching the intersection of faith and leadership. And I have a, a bit of a footnote. I want everyone in the audience to know that today I will use the terms spirituality and faith interchangeably. I decided as part of the Dovery Center mentoring program that my final project would involve interviewing Concordia donors whose benevolence I experienced through my role in advancement. I referred to Concordia donors in my final paper as storied stewards. I remember during that uh, mentoring program that we each had a limited amount of time to present our final projects, and I was carrying on and on. And my dear friend, Dr. Larry Papenfuss, who I'm looking out at, said to me, oh, dear Lonnie, this could be a dissertation. And it became one. <laughs> Another mentoring moment. Isn't that terrific? Have I shared that story with you, Larry? Thank you. Let's advance the slides, shall we? I get so carried away here. Okay. So why is this research so important? The sheer frenetic pace of our lives, hierarchical mazes that are a part of workplace architecture, the global landscape in our work, occur. all of these phenomenons occur that contribute to the complexity of leading well. Thomas Friedman, in one of my favorite books entitled Thank You for Being Late, An Optimist Guide to Thriving in an Age of Acceleration, referred to these times of tectonic shift as the supernova of times. Can't you feel it? I know I can. This is a time of technological acceleration, globalization, and environmental change. Here's what's so interesting. The problem is pace, and ironically, the answer is pause. The problem is pace, and the answer is pause. We are a society incessantly preoccupied with the outer life. The inner and the outer life appear to be competing ideas. Our action-oriented ego, on the one hand, 
and the world of contemplation and grace on the other. The pace leaves us clamoring for authentic connection and community, for a sense of belonging in an age where isolation is an epidemic, despite the myriad ways that we have to stay connected through social media. The idea of quietly pausing to deeply discern is a counter-cultural phenomenon. Culture often tells us to take quick and expeditious action, and in doing so, take what you can get at the same time. Each of the participants in my study recognized the need to integrate their inner and outer lives. They seemed to understand the significance of spiritual practice in their own lives and the significance and the benefits to the lives of their followers who were looking for mentors and added meaning in the workplace environment where so much of us spend so much of our time. The purpose was to investigate, again, how U.S. Midwestern leaders use spiritual practice to become self-aware and critically reflective of their role and responsibilities as ethical leaders. The participants in my study included 20 Midwest leaders, CEOs, executives, business owners, entrepreneurs, upper-level management, representing mid-size to large organizations in various sectors, including but not limited to banking, finance, manufacturing, agriculture, education, and the nonprofit sector. The largest organization employed over 1,200 people. There was an equal number of men and women. And there was also an equal number of Lutherans and Catholics, 10 Lutherans and 10 Catholics. But I assure you that symmetry was purely coincidental, but delightful nonetheless. For the academics in the room, my approach to analysis was an exploratory case study within the qualitative research methodology. Now, my study is relevant to each of us, wherever we are called to leadership, in our extended families, at work, in our church communities, volunteering, and in our neighborhoods. My hope is that we see the value in seeing things whole, seeing things in integrated fashion, in a place where life, livelihood, and the spirit are inextricably bound together. Researchers Senge, Sharmer, Jaworski, and Flowers suggest the key to seeing things whole is developing the capacity not only to suspend our assumptions, but to redirect our awareness toward the generative process that lies behind what we see. Attributes of servant leadership, including listening, empathy, awareness, commitment to the growth of people, and the ability to redirect one's awareness were all common themes. These qualities, along with possessing a non-judgmental mindset, compassion, integrity, respect, an understanding of what leadership looks like from the vantage point of being a servant. Each one of the participants talked about desiring to be a servant within their organizations. I distinctly remember one participant during one of the interviews said this to me. She said, Lonnie, Christ was really serious when he said, do not judge lest ye be judged. It doesn't come easy, though, does it? One participant's comment struck me when he said, 
in some instances, I have to be painfully respectful. She made a habit of asking herself to look more deeply, to find something good about the individual that she was in conflict with. Pain and respect are not often words that I put together in the same sentence. But we all know civility does matter. Our leadership involves personal discernment, self-discovery, self-awareness, self-monitoring, and self-regulation. Let's all pause for a moment and take just a few minutes individually to look at the exercise on your table. Um, there's a sheet of eight on each table, exercise one and two. I want everyone to individually look at the questions on exercise one and just ponder them yourself at the table. And the questions include, who is a spiritual mentor in life and work? What attributes do they possess? Is gratitude among their power tools? If so, how is gratitude practiced within the organization? What stories, customs, ceremonies, and events inform your organizational culture and contribute to a sense of meaningful connection to people in the workplace, especially in relationship to others? So we're just going to take a moment individually to take a look at those. For the sake of time, we're going to move quickly on, but I, I do want to ask, I'm curious, was it easy for you to identify a spiritual mentor in your life? Show of hands, if, if it's yes, just want to see the hands. Okay, that, that would have been my assumption. Um, I'm also curious to ask, when you think of that mentor in your life, was gratitude among their power tools? Yes, we've got a resounding yes here. Show of hands again as you think about the attributes that person possessed. Was gratitude among them? Quite a few hands. Thank you. Now I want to encourage each of you to bring these exercises back with you to the workplace and share them among your coworkers. The dreaded literature review. I am not going to spend a lot of time here, folks. But I do want to highlight just a few things. The concept of spirituality in the workplace emerged in the academy in the early 2000s. Now, naturally, I know you find this hard to believe, but scholars have varying viewpoints. Numerous scholars, however, recognized that individuals increasingly view work and spirituality as integrated elements and noted an interest in the increase of spirituality within the workplace that moves beyond the taboo of separating matters of the spirit and workplace integration. The theoretical lenses that I used for analysis included servant, authentic, and transformational leadership, and again, Servant leadership resonated with each of the individuals I interviewed. Moving on to major themes that I discovered. Again, the purpose was to investigate how U.S. Midwest leaders use spiritual practice to become self-aware and critically reflective of their role and responsibility as ethical leaders. This diagram is also on your table. It's the green uh, tree. 
And I'm going to ask you to pass that around your table because you'll be able to follow along as we move through the presentation. So let's take a moment to consider the various forms of inner life practice among the participants. I often say that I can put my dissertation into a nutshell, an acorn to be exact, and you see the acorn on the diagram. Now the acorn is a symbol of the presentation sisters and it provided the backdrop and the imagery throughout my dissertation. And the acorn represents the seed of spiritual practice and the essence of who we have the privilege of becoming both individually and as leaders within our organizations. One's spiritual practice is the powerful pause representing the invisible seed that ultimately becomes the mighty oak. The acorn possesses a deep and divine urge to live out its full potential. The divine urge ultimately unfolds into a rich and full canopy of branches. Similarly, our spiritual practice nourishes the seed of who we are becoming and over time grows the branches of our ultimate design. We are sowers, as Jeff shared in his opening prayer. Now today, we are graced with this lovely image of a burr oak tree in full fall splendor, an acorn that realized its beautiful potential. Artist Joni Altringer is my guest today, and, and right here, give us a wave, Joni. Joni is also a fellow presentation associate and again painted this lovely image. I shared a homily earlier this summer and Joni happened to uh, hear that homily. After I shared the homily, she came up to me and she said, Lonnie, I want you to find an oak tree that speaks to you and all painted for you. Well, no one had ever asked me a question like that. I mean, what a question, right? And so all of a sudden, I was on this mission to find this tree. Now, I knew that the tree needed to be strong. It needed to be bold. It needed to be sturdy. It needed to be wise, having weathered challenges over the years. And at the same time, it needed to be graceful, having extended shelter, compassion, and nourishment to people and creatures over the years. I did what any researcher would do when I knew I needed to find that tree. And so I called an oak tree expert, and I thought, what is he going to say? What are you looking for? Uh, this specific tree that speaks to you. So I found Dr. Zaletsky, and when he called me back, I'd earlier left a message, and he called me back, and do you know what he said? Lonnie, I know exactly where your tree is. What? I thought, I said, you're kidding. He said, no, I know exactly where your tree is. you know where it is? I said, no. He said, it is just south of Detroit Lakes, of course, it is located on St. Mary's Lake Road, just down the road from the Catholic Church. And in fact, I know it's nearly 300 years old, which is in keeping oddly with presentation foundress Nan O'Nagel, um, because I cored that very oak tree. So here it is, that oak tree. And so if you ever want to go on an oak tree pilgrimage, I'm probably going to have to tie a yellow ribbon around it or something, but, but it's there. And now um, I thought about that, and I knew I didn't want to press my luck because there are so many people that inspired my work, including Concordia and my Lutheran Heritage pilgrimage. I wasn't going to press my luck and try to find a 500-year-old oak tree in honor of the Reformation. So, Joni, perhaps that's our next tree. This lovely image shows how beautiful we have the potential of becoming through intentionally pausing to nurture our spiritual practice 
and in doing so, weathering storms and providing nourishment to others. Our lives can become a colorful, rich, and full canopy of branches that reveal the invisible seed becoming visible through integrating our spiritual practice in the workplace and beyond. Inner life practices represent, again, the power of the seed and depict the growth potential concealed within the seed. All participants expressed a commitment to their spiritual practices. The great majority of participants began and ended their day with spiritual practice, a variety of spiritual practices that you see at the root of the tree. One participant called her spiritual practice that thread to hold on to. Several referred to spiritual practice as a grounding and a centering force in their lives. The root system of the oak tree represents the various forms of inner life practices that included, and you see on the image, reflection, prayer, spiritual reading, journaling, spending time in nature, unique ritual practices, and everyone held a mindset of gratitude. Several participants said that gratitude was foundational to their practice. And many referenced that over time, their spiritual practice naturally involved into a practice of gratitude, praise, and thanksgiving. One participant said, gratitude is one of the most important lessons in life. He said, what do you do if you're grateful? Well, you behave differently, right? If you're really, truly grateful, people know that. They'll appreciate that. They'll rise to a level they might not have risen to before. The mindset of gratitude was often accompanied by meaningful artifacts. And this was among the most interesting aspects of my research. The transition from the personal sphere to the professional sphere regarding spiritual practice. And it was interestingly similar among all the participants. Each participant had at least one artifact at work that served as a reminder of the benefits of staying in touch with their spirituality, especially in the work setting. Artifacts abounded and included, but are not limited to a gold leaf star, a butterfly, sage, a prairie angel, a favorite Bible verse that more than one person articulated having a lifelong relationship with, even a Keurig coffee pot that to this individual represented the importance of hospitality and being a light on the hill to all who entered her office. Another image, a kaleidoscope award, which represented the importance of accepting people with differences and having respect for all people. This participant commented, it reminds me to ask myself, am I accepting of people and things no matter what they look like? As details change, can I change with them? Can I still keep all of that, my faith, my spirituality, the beliefs that I hold true. Other unique personal items adorned offices, reminding participants of, again, their spiritual foundation. A painting of a family farmstead that signified a sense of rootedness to the family lineage and the role of family in shaping their lives, values, virtues, and faith. A rock from a leadership pilgrimage that reminded another participant of the women of faith who founded the organization he now served and the importance of continuing to honor their tradition and rich heritage. The rock also reminded him of an antiphon from St. Francis of Assisi. And the antiphon is this, preach the gospel at all times and if necessary, use words. 
each of several participants, not all of them, but so many of them talked about the importance of walking the talk as leaders. Another had a moral compass atop his desk that served as a constant reminder to remain centered in the midst of workplace challenges. Another had an image of a simple painting, a man polishing a hat. A simple image, but he was doing it with such deep reverence. A prairie angel that represented a gift from a patient that to this individual represented the need, represented the need to be light and to tread lightly in the workplace. And she said, every morning when I come to work, I'd always stop to offer a prayer. When I turn my key, I'd offer another prayer for all who entered, that they may be blessed. For all the phone calls that I knew I would receive in that day, that they would all be blessed. Another had an image of Christ that was shaped by numerous modern-day saints that we would recognize, Gandhi, Mother Teresa. And this image symbolized the diversity of faiths and the need and the desire to see the face of Christ in all people. Another showed the image of an expansive prairie sky that provided her solace and peace. She looked at the image and she said to me, all nature reflects God. This picture brings me peace and calmness during my days. Each of the art artifacts caught participants' attention and brought them back to that place of self-reflection and awareness during their busy days. Ritual practices, including one person walking her farmstead every morning and watering pumpkins to the Hail Mary, which she said provided just the right amount of water. Another had a glass bowl of beads that he kept in his office that reminded him of the number of weeks that he would live out his life if he lived to be the age of 80. Someone one day anonymously dropped off this glass bowl of beads in his office. And he said, now, every Friday, when it's quiet, I close my door and give thanks for the week, and I take one more glass bead out of the bowl. Over time, the number of beads go down. It helped him to reflect on his mortality and the significance of the gift of each new day and the importance of measuring his days. His deep reverence for life became his operating modus of operandi in life and in leadership. Another participant shared his gratitude ritual. And he said this, on the weekends when my wife and I have more time, we make a practice of making a pot of tea and putting a note of gratitude in our gratitude bowl. And, uh, and during especially challenging times, we will dump out the entire bowl of gratitude notes and recount them. And inevitably, it moves us back to that place of gratitude, even in the midst of challenges. One participant made a practice of choosing a word that she needed to work on every year. This particular year, her special word that she knew she needed to work on was patience. So she worked on patience for a year, and then she was praying and thoughtfully discerning, what is that word that I need to pick this year? What is that word? It just wasn't coming to her. And so she went home and she told her teenage son that she was struggling with that word for the next year. And he said, hello, mom, you need a patience do-over. <laughs> Isn't that great? Well, you are most likely getting the sense of the richness of ritual and the uniqueness of artifacts that are as unique as the individuals themselves. I could share numerous other examples. However, for the sake of time, we need to move along, but I do want to share two more things about that inner life journey. Everyone talked about the importance of 
being connected to a community, whatever that community was, a Bible study, a church community, this community. And everyone also talked about their spiritual life and practice as being an ongoing journey that never ends. And you see that arrow that goes up the side of that tree on that image, and that represents growth over time. Meister Eckhart, a 15th century Dominican, said, What we plant in the soil of contemplation, we shall reap in the action of harvest. This image depicts how spiritual practice showed up in the workplace. So look now at the canopy of branches on that handout. The branches reveal the in invisible seed becoming visible through integration of spiritual practice, our inner life becoming an outward expression and included attributes of servant leadership, ethical actions, integrity, respect, compassion, being non-judgmental, valuing relationships, and understanding the importance of being a mentor in the lives of others. Now what's interesting is, is you saw having a spiritual mentor was in the roots in inner life practice, and here it is again. Individuals recognize the importance of giving back and being a mentor in the lives of others. Each of the study participants expressed the integral nature of their spiritual practice contributing to understanding oneself that was genuinely and continually shaping their leadership narrative. One participant said this, my spiritual journey changed my work pattern. Another shared, I am who I am at home. I am who I am in my spiritual life. I am who I am as a leader, as president, as CEO. They are all bound together. They're inextricably bound. The vast majority of participants worked in the public sector, yet they discovered ways to integrate spirituality in the workplace. Leaders found creative ways to incorporate liturgy in the workplace without calling it liturgy in the workplace. Examples included bringing food to staff meetings, reading poetry, spending time reflecting with one's team, offering hospitality, sending cards, creating ritual, shaping meaningful organizational stories and workplace celebrations. One stated, it's the way you interact with customers and employees every day and again, he said, it's walking the talk. Participants could readily articulate their organizational core values and continue to nurture those organizational core values through such practices as having core value breakfasts, company picnics, supporting benevolence funds, both within one's organization and the, in the communities in which the organizations resided. And the list goes on. Several also talked about the challenges in leadership and how important their discipline of spiritual practice was becoming, keeping a, them again centered and grounded. One participant talked about the challenge of terminating personnel and sometimes whole departments during economic downtimes. One stated, the most difficult thing in senior management is when you terminate someone. Those were times of great faith for me. Another stated, personnel issues where misconduct and inequities were present. Our team would talk about where does mercy fit into this? Because on one hand, you have the responsibility and the welfare of the institution to keep in mind and there must be consequences. And on the other hand, one believes in redemption. Leaders admitted they didn't have simple answers to confounding workplace challenges. And with this, when they expressed that, they said it with such a deep sense of humility that comes from leaders who have been through confounding and challenging workplace circumstances.
When organizational mandates are difficult to share, one participant referred to delivering hard-to-take tells. When one needed to deliver an organizational mandate that was, was going to be challenge, challenging, hard-to-take tells. And she said this, during these times, she became self-aware enough to be aware of her default moments. Where she went when she as a leader was experiencing stress. And she learned over time through her practice to distinguish where her needs were and what the needs of the individual were. Self-monitoring, self-awareness, self-reflection. Several talked about seeing challenges earlier in their career as really clear-cut and very easy to fix. There were times early on, this participant said, when I wanted people to know that I was in charge. I think that was my own insecurity. I think at that time in my career, something was missing. Spiritual practice informed professional ethics. It played an important role in decision making and discernment and the desire to do the right thing always. Doing the right thing sometimes conflicted what was with what was legally required. Sometimes what was legally required was a lesser standard but it was good tactical business practice to do the right thing always and extend the organization beyond perhaps what, was, what could be done legally. One participant commented, it is a higher moral plane to do the right thing always. Doing the right thing often takes additional time and involves thoughtful deliberations with team members, board members, and others. One participant shared a two-year-long conversation about whether or not to acquire another organization as a part of a corporate merger. After two years of lengthy deliberations, it was determined that it simply wasn't the right organizational fit. There were numerous examples of valuing relationships with employees, board members, and community members one participant commented that it meant for her moving away from board meetings that were that where reports were quick, quickly reviewed. Instead, she created opportunities for generative discussion and dialogue at both the board level and the team level. There was an attitude of, let's do this together. One leader held quarterly board meetings and also held quarterly team meetings. Annual events provided special occasions and opportunities to strengthen culture and build community. One participant said, every time I go to the organization's family picnic, I can't go there without getting a lump in my throat because I see these employees every day. Then I see their spouses and I see their children. You realize those families, every one of those individuals, is dependent upon the organization for their livelihood. He went on to talk about the really good organizations are the ones that win more than employees' minds. They win employees' hearts. A number share the importance of doing the little things well. Handwritten personal notes, birthday cards, anniversary cards, he said, when an employee gets a little older and no one remembers their birthday except their mother, I do. One executive created a blog that was a series of reflections about what he was observing at the various worksite locations across the Midwest. He made a habit of writing and blogging about the good things he was seeing. It became an ongoing habit of sharing his observations with employees and employees consequently looked forward to and valued reading his blogs because it was about them. This series of organizational blogs ultimately became a book about their organization and their belief and value in servant leadership. 
I'm going to move beyond the theoretical lenses. We touched briefly on that. And we're going to move on to the second exercise. We're here again, we're not going to take time, but I'm simply going to articulate those questions because it's my hope that you'll take these exercises into the workplace with you and consider with your team members, what rituals inform your leadership? What could you creatively add to your individual or organizational ritual? What artifacts can be found in your office that contribute to your ability to remain grounded and centered? What does your organization do to win the hearts of people? And I'll add, what human resource development and policy implications could include building connectedness to organizational mission, vision, and values? It could perhaps include incorporating many and extended retreats, contemplative practices, unique ritual, and attention to workplace setting and specific artifacts. And now conclusions. So here is what I discovered over eight years and two years of spending time with incredible Midwest leaders. Our inner life practices do influence our life and livelihood. Integration of inner life practices contribute to a leader's sense of heightened awareness, valuing positive relational elements, and respecting the dignity and diversity of all people. Inner life practices contribute to professional ethics and one's ability to reflectively navigate, especially during challenging times. And lastly, I want to share that in addition to all of these findings, I discovered an interesting aside discussion that I had with many participants on the distinction between spirituality and faith. And this could be an entire workshop unto itself. What a majority of participants had in common was that they made a distinction between their religious and their spiritual practices. While religion was perhaps not an acceptable topic for the workplace, spirituality was. While specific religious practices were kept perhaps private, spiritual practices could be shared. While their faith tradition was specific and defined, their spirituality was diverse, exploratory, and open to the experience of distinct differences among others' spiritual practices. One participant captured the sentiments well, I think, when she said this, I really differentiate spiritual practices from religious practices. I think that, for some people, they're the same. And for others, they're different. And for some, they overlap. It's as simple as that. There are numerous, there are four pages of implications, and I also want to share. I'm happy to share this PowerPoint. Um, if you want to give me your business card, I'm happy to forward it. I, again, hope that you can have rich conversations at your workplace. Again, four pages. I'm going to spare you, but they're there if you want to see them, nonetheless. And here you see my dissertation is, in fact, in a nutshell, all 222 pages I managed to, managed to tuck it in, which was not an easy task even to bring it to you today, which has been such a privilege and an honor. And so with deep gratitude, I want to thank you for your time and being present. And I especially want to thank the storied stewards at Concordia. I want to thank the 20 remarkable Midwest leaders who were a part of my journey, who I also now consider my spiritual mentors. Thank you for your attention. Can you hear me now?
Wasn't that a wonderful public uh, defense of a dissertation? <laughs> 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 Did you get to do that before? Or, you know, uh, with a room of uh, 80 like people? Not like this. I had three. Yeah. See? So now you get to share it. Exactly. Anyway, um, we've got some minutes here, so you can ask Jody any questions you have or make comments about what you heard. And we've got some mi microphones. Joni. Oh yes, it's nearly at 300 years old. And, and here is what Joni wrote about this old oak tree. This old oak tree dates back to 1743, is located, interestingly enough, on St. Mary's Lake Road, south of Detroit Lakes, Minnesota. She is the oldest oak tree in Minnesota and North Dakota that we know has been cored to date. This sturdy tree has lived through extreme heat and extreme cold. Over the years, she has given shelter to many people and animals. Her beauty and strength has touched the souls of many, and her acorns have fed the animals. The oak tree has long been a symbol of the Presentation Sisters. And from the acorn, Nano's compassion for the poor and concern for the faith, this sturdy oak tree represents that image. Isn't it beautiful? We've got to find one 500 years old. It's going to be tough. Thank you, Joni. Others? Did you go into the study with the idea of the oak, or how did that evolve oh, that's a, throughout the study? That's a great question, and as I earlier articulated, um, what piqued my interest in the connectedness to faith in the workplace was my 15 years spent at Concordia College, and during this time, um, my husband and, all, and I also became presentation associates, and so it was in the back of my mind, but it wasn't an image, and all of a sudden, there it was, and it seemed to make sense. So I, I'll call that divine inspiration. Nice to avoid it, but why don't you say a little bit about the Jeremiah Project? Oh, thank you very much. Um, the Jeremiah Program, and I'm two months into my new role as Executive Director, and I want to acknowledge my team members here and, and board member Joanne Warner. Thank you so much, uh, team members from Jeremiah, for being here. It's a program that began 20 years ago in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and I'm incredibly proud of the Fargo-Moorhead community because this is the first community that built a residential model for Jeremiah, and it's because of the incredible benevolence of this community. And so there is uh, uh, 20 apartments that can accommodate 20 single moms. We have a child development center. Our director is seated right here. And we can accommodate 52 young people, including uh, the children of the moms who reside in that space. And I'm excited to share that at the end of January, um, we will fill the apartments with 20 women and more children in the Child Development Center and have the privilege also um, to extend into the community um, to offer child development to other families of, of low income. And the program also includes a 12-week empowerment program, which all women uh, are required to complete. Everyone needs to be enrolled full-time in school, take life skills courses, work part-time. So, you know, I, I often say I feel like I'm the dean of women. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great place to be. Thank you for asking that. Other questions? President Kraft. First of all, we're honored to have you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for uh, a great presentation. Thank you. Uh, I, I confess that I've been stuck back on uh, pace and pause. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm much better at the first than I am at the second. Um, and um, I, I will, as an illustration, I'll mention that I used to work at another college far, far away from here. Uh, and at that college, uh, the faculty did something that I thought was really wise and thoughtful. They created a block of time in the week when there was a pause. 
Uh, and in this pause, the, the, the sort of pinky square agreement was that there were going to be no regular meetings, no regular classes, no, uh, you know, uh, team, uh, sports team practices and so on. And everybody felt really good about this uh, until, I don't know, a week later. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and because of the role that I had, people began calling me and saying, you know. People are violating uh, this, uh, this agreement. The strength coach has, has called regular you know, weightlifting uh, sessions during this. There are academic departments that are secretly meeting uh, uh, at, at this time. And, uh, and you know, when I, I wasn't, I didn't want to be the pause police sure. uh, at, at this institution, but I mean, it illustrates for me, to be serious, it illustrates for me how hard this is. When I would call people and say, um, you know, you're really not supposed to have a regular whatever at this, they would say, well, we know, but it's the only time we can do it <laughs> because it's the only time that's protected. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious about what you found or what you observed in, you know, in your own experience about are, are we past the point where we can do this? Uh, or what are the ways in which people find right. uh, and a moment to pause, and, and in this case, to be a little strict, I don't mean, say, on the weekends. Uh, I mean, in our work. It, uh, thank you, President Kraft. It is both an individual discipline and also an organizational discipline, right? And discipline. Discipline is kind of a dirty word, right? We don't like the word discipline. But what I discovered, it is, it is the little things. It's that executive who chose, you know, frequently to write a blog when he visited the various site locations of the organization. He took the time himself. It was his discipline that influenced his organization. And so what leaders also found was their individual disciplines ultimately impacted their followers. So that was just such a terrific example. And so that series of blogs over decades became a book about the organization's servant leadership. It's just a great story. But it's also the little things. It's, it's that individual mindset that one brings with you to work. When you have that individual discipline, you know, we're responsible for that and imbuing our days you know, how we live and move and have our being in our life of faith at work, it's, it's up to us. But then carrying it through into the organization is another matter, right? The pause police, yes, um, that's a tough role. But I, but I want to challenge everyone to take these questions and these exercises back to your organizations because we all know as leaders when these pieces come from the organization, then there is, of course, greater ownership in them. And so I want to challenge you to creatively identify a new organizational ritual practice, ceremony, celebration. And it could be a benevolence fund. It could be in a public organization. There was a, a prayer chain, and it was not a faith-based organization. But this particular leader made a point of being on that prayer chain himself. It's providing benevolence to employees who are moving through challenging times. It's, it's being benevolent in the community in which your organization resides. It's having a committee that identifies where those dollars are shared. Yes. Oh practices are yes. because as President Kraft, your question for pause, it doesn't necessarily need to be a long length of time, but yet a meaningful point of time and pause. Of course, my own daughter knows my secret, and so now I'm going to reveal it. And so I'm so happy, you know, I wear this watch, and the battery has been dead for like five years. I'm, I'm serious. If you look at it right now, it is always set to 1111 because after I interviewed all of these amazing Midwest leaders, they had all of these creative rituals and practices that I was just so delighted. 
I wanted to create my own. And so I'll offer it out to each of you. I call it gratitude on the ones. And so you know how we are running through our days. We incessantly are looking at our watch. And so when I do that, I pause. Or when I see a series of three ones on a license plate, I will stop and count 11 blessings. I can see them on my grocery receipt. There they are again. I've got to stop and pause and count 11 blessings. I started out by saying my, my ritual was going to be when I saw just two ones. But I was counting my blessings all day long. I could hardly <laughs> get any work done. And so I changed it to three ones, and that's working for me, <laughs> along with my watch. Thank you. Thank you. I forgot about that. That's my thing. Thank you all so very much. Oh, yes. <laughs> and I know Alex. Presentation today. Uh, I want to be very grateful for your presentation today. I'm always fascinated by the, the aura you have, which is sometimes quite impressive, but at the same time reassuring. So combining both, um, merci beaucoup. Uh, my question was, I, I recently watched uh, a YouTube video of a lady named Carla Harris, woman that did uh, 30 years on Wall Street, who's sharing a lot of her experience. And she talked about um, uh, competence currency and relationship currency. Mm -hmm. So it's saying how when you're navigating many systems, you have to know how to obviously be competent, but as well nurture relationships. So your competence, I mean, you've showed us today. I, I don't need to speak to that. But I was wondering, uh, a, a person like yourself with your stellar personality, how do you, with the myriad of experiences you have, how do you nurture so many relationships without sometimes maybe overlooking one over mm -hmm. the other? I mean, it's, yeah, it's without spreading yourself too thin, obviously. So I'm just curious. Thank you. Thank you for the question. And, and of course, it's a daily challenge, right, to be to be mindful and to be present and, and not be um, stuck in the past on something that occurred or way out there in the future, but, but do my best to be prayerfully present with the person that's in front of me. And I also, um, it is great blessing um, to be married to Jeff because we, of course, share our practice and for decades, our practice as a couple has been to have coffee every morning. You know, it's amazing that I get to work at 8 because we spend about 45 minutes every day framing our days through daily devotion, through a gratitude practice, and talking together about our days. And then, of course, at the end of the days, um, we distill, you know, what occurred in our day and we can help each other in partnership, and so I'm very, very grateful for that. Thank you. I guess there's a last question. Oh. <laughs> I have a, my name is Izzet al -Haider. I'm one of the New American community leaders. So I have a kind of a comment. It could be like a comment on a question. So when you're mentioning those uh, three uh, terms, spirituality, religion, and I just, you were talking about mindfulness. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's like religion is about divine, not always, cause like, you know, d depending on different faiths and religions, each looking at the situation in their own scope. And spirituality, I am seeing spirituality in nature, like what nature wants us to do, to have a, to have a kind of, uh, a harmony in our environment. So the environment it could be our workplace or life or community or whatever. And mindfulness, I'm, I see it as a kind of a personal, how to have a personal or inner. So if we try it, we know that they have a kind like, there's too much similarity between them. But if we try to differentiate between spirituality and mindfulness. Let's say spiritual leader and mindful leader. So how could you make that differentiation? Thank you. You know, it, um, many felt that they're inextricably bound together as, as a whole, that, that, you know, one's practice, religious practice or spiritual practice 
um, contributed to one's mindfulness. One nurtured the other, and so they are really inextricably bound. But practice, spiritual practice, as I mentioned, is you is as unique as the individuals, as the individuals themselves. Um, you know, for one person, um, being in nature and and seeing. Uh, the image of God in nature is part of her spiritual practice. Um, at the same time, there is, um, there is a, an air of caution that leaders bring that work in a public sector um, because sometimes the idea of a religion can seem divisive. But as I mentioned, leaders who had a a deep spiritual practice and faith, I use those terms interchangeably, found a way to bring themselves, their whole self, into the workplace. And so everyone sees those differently, but I guess, you know, to many, they're inextricably bound together. And, you know, that's another workshop. (laughs) Indeed it is. (laughs) Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Well, um, yeah, we shall pause for December so that you can celebrate with your family and January because you will be recovering from celebrating with your family. We'll meet again in February and um, Jody Buck right there. You want to wave at the people? There we go. Um, We'll actually pick up from that last question that um, that Haida just asked um, to help us contemplate conscious leadership. So pick one of these cards, go with it so that you don't forget to sign up. Thank you so much for coming today. Have a great Thanksgiving uh, season and um, we shall see you in February.